sounds, perfumes, images, flavors, a trip to Vietnam is a celebration of the senses. At the crossroads of history and civilizations, this country has safeguarded the heritage of cultures that pervade it. An ever-moving population reacts to the bustling of the cities turned towards the future. The bally of bicycles and the noisy merchants blend with the contemplation in the pagodas. From the northern mountain tribes to the southern fishermen, it is difficult to summarize Vietnam in a postcard. This country has much more to offer, a turbulent history that is extremely rich. Ho Chi Minh City, formerly Saigon, crystallizes all of Vietnam's paradoxes from its ancient history and colonial past to its communist regime and unavoidable move towards the bright horizons of the consumer society. It is here that the changes sweeping Vietnam are the most obvious. From all over the country, this city attracts people who hope to have a better life. Here, we touch upon the essence and paradoxes of modern Vietnam. The motorcycles, cell phones and miniskirts of the younger generation coexist with the pagodas, political convictions and religious faith of the older generations. Marx is talking and MTV answers. Ho Chi Minh City has not given up its old name. Here, people still call it Saigon. We are heading for Sholong, the Chinatown of Saigon. The Bin Te Market is a masterpiece of Chinese architecture with the clock tower in its center. The soil produces rice and the sea and rivers are rife with fish. These two ingredients are the foundations of Vietnamese cooking. Its very long coastline offers the Vietnamese an amazing variety of shellfish and fish. Several stalls specialize in cutting and preparing fish according to specific recipes. In the heart of the city's Chinatown, key staples of this cuisine such as Peking duck can also be found. If the quality of a country's cuisine is measured by the diversity of its food products, Vietnam is unquestionably among the best. After the leading products in the supporting rolls, a myriad of sharp tasting roots and aromatic plants that give snacks, soups and stews their spicy and original flavors. Phu, or noodle soup, can be found almost everywhere. It's a nourishing and balanced, handy and economical meal. The traveling salesmen contribute to the market's animation with their acrobat number through the crowd using a balancing platter system. Religious monuments, mainly pagodas in various styles, Chinese or Vietnamese, are scattered throughout the city. Four major faiths have shaped the spiritual life of the Vietnamese people. Buddhism, Confucianism, Taoism and later on Christianity introduced by the missionaries. But the great majority of the population is Buddhist. It's easy to enter the pagodas as long as you take your shoes off to better enjoy the meditative calmness of the place. The monks' prayers and the soft smoke of the incense. Near the market, the Tien Ho Pagoda, built by the Cantonese congregation in the early 19th century, is dedicated to the goddess of the sea. According to this faith, this deity can cross the oceans on a mat and ride the clouds to save boats in distress. The families of fishermen come here to ask for the goddess's protection. The curls of incense smoke rise in symbols of requests.
On the altar, three figures of Tian Ho line up flanked by two guardians. A vestige of colonization, Notre Dame Cathedral was built in 1883. A crowd gathers for mass. Many stay in front of the cathedral on their motorcycles. Among the numerous foreigners attending the Catholic service will equally hear the priests speak Vietnamese, French or English. Across from Notre Dame Cathedral, the post office was inspired by the French colonial style. This type of architecture is quite common in Vietnam and French tourists will feel a certain familiarity. They should beware of arrogant attitudes. This country inflicted the French a humiliating defeat and everyone knows how the most powerful army in the world was bogged down. The Vietnamese proudly assert their identity. Among the numerous covered markets, Ben Tan is the liveliest and most colorful one. The main entrance, surmounted by a belfry and a clock, has become the symbol of Saigon. Many food products are found here. Built in 1914, Bentan market was called Leal Central by the French. The large variety of fruit, vegetables and spices in the south, due to the proximity of the Mekong River, offers an amazing diversity of products, the basis of a flavorful cuisine. Curries have been prepared since the dawn of time and contrary to the original Indian version, these are not very spicy. Artistic life is very rich and often influenced by the religion. The Park Hyatt Hotel has a beautiful art collection, including works by Pham Hoang, originally from Hai Fong, who was seduced by the beauty and spirituality of the Buddhist nuns. Formerly called the Museum of Chinese and American War Crimes, the War Remnants Museum is one of the most visited by the Westerners. Most of the atrocities displayed here were also widely shown in the West. Nevertheless, the details of these exactions presented by the victims themselves remain very impressive. The war has left deep wounds, practically no family was spared. Another spectacular place that witnessed the conflict is the Reunification Palace with its amazing modern architecture. Symbol of the South Vietnamese government, the building remained as it was on April 30th, 1975, the day the Republic of Vietnam ceased to exist. In Saigon's chaotic traffic, the visitor often feels like he's in a video game. Motorcycles and bicycles surge from everywhere. The rule of the game is to simply avoid an accident you may often think you're going to die. Yet, at the last second, everybody miraculously gets through. The game intensifies during floods, but apparently everybody seems used to moving around in these conditions, yet many accidents are to be deplored. At night, the center of Saigon continues to live at a mad pace, swept up in the whirl of motorcycles that slalom between old French colonial buildings. The old town hall is one of the city's major landmarks, an easy meeting place from where you may go on until the next morning. Leaving Saigon for the southern tip of Vietnam, we first reach the Mekong Delta. A trip to the rice basket of the country provides a better comprehension of the importance of the farmers who work every day to feed a population of 85 million people. The Mekong Delta not only feeds its inhabitants but the entire country and also exports a major part of its production. The Mekong Delta shines in multiple colors, from the shimmering green of the rice fields to the blue and white of the schoolchildren's uniforms on bicycles. 
It's a pity the pollution and stress deprive us of the smile of these elegant Vietnamese. Kong To is the main city of the area and a political and cultural center of the Mekong. The local economy is essentially agricultural. This charming and vibrant city is connected to the other towns of the Delta by a network of canals and small rivers. The floating markets attract many wholesalers and farmers. Contrary to the Thai markets where small wooden boats slip through narrow canals, the Vietnamese markets are usually set up in places where the river is wide. The markets generally start early in the morning to avoid the midday heat. The tide also has to be reckoned with. To navigate, the larger boats must wait for the water to rise. The wholesalers arrive with the largest vessels full to the brim. The goods are transferred to smaller boats that supply the local markets. Here in this perpetual movement, the Mekong truly gives the impression of being a vital artery of the economy in the south. The merchants set up long poles on their boats so the goods they sell can be identified. All over the Delta area, the abundance of food staples is tied to the Mekong River. Shaped by silt deposits and due to a continuous sedimentation process, the delta relentlessly and naturally extends into the ocean, currently at the rate of 80 meters per year. The Mekong is so wide that the tide makes its way up the river. In addition to the numerous rice fields and fish farms, the rich fertile soil produces fruit, coconuts and sugarcane. The mainly rural delta area is one of the most populated of Vietnam and intensive agriculture is used on practically every piece of land. The Mekong is one of the longest rivers in the world, and its delta is one of the widest. Life in a regularly flooded plain isn't always easy for the population. The houses are built on stilts for protection against the rising water. For transportation, the boats use thousands of canals that must regularly be dredged to remain navigable. Making rice paper is a traditional activity. It is used to make spring rolls and deep-fried nem rolls. The paper is steamed over a brazier fed with rice straw. In the ancient Indian language, the word rice was danya, which means sustainer of the human race. This word also accurately describes how important rice is for the Vietnamese. <laughs> According to a local legend, there was a time when rice didn't have to be harvested. It was asked for with prayers and sent from heaven in each home in the shape of a large bull. One day, a man asked his wife to sweep the floor before the rice arrived, but when the huge ball suddenly appeared, she was still sweeping and accidentally hit it, breaking it into a thousand pieces. Since that day, the Vietnamese must work hard and pick the rice by hand. We are heading north to the high plateau area in central Vietnam. In Dala, the portico of the Lam Thai Pagoda is the masterpiece of its only Buddhist monk, Vien Thuc, an educated man who made a fortune with instant paintings he sold for a few dollars. 
is still there to bless passing visitors as well as the members of this devout community. This relentless and somewhat eccentric worker is said to be the wealthiest man in the area. He planted flowers and created the gardens in different styles, including a Japanese garden with bonsais. Shaded alleys and arbors complete the adornment of this harbour of serenity. Jewels of the Highlands, the Dalar region is strewn with lakes, waterfalls, gardens and forests. Its cooler climate and beautiful landscapes make it a most enjoyable destination in Vietnam. Dala used to be famous for hunting big game. Hunting was so good that most of the major species have disappeared. Protected today, the crocodiles can peacefully sleep in the sun. During wonderful hikes in the forest, you can go up the rivers and discover numerous waterfalls. Dala has preserved the features of an old colonial city. The cathedral with its strange architecture was finished in 1942 for the French residents and vacationers. The Cogwheel train station also is a witness to this colorful colonial past. An old Russian steam engine is exhibited inside. In 1929, the Cog Railway connected Dala to Tap Cham, and it was reopened for tourist purposes to reach nearby destinations. Here you can visit the magnificent Lin Fuok Pagoda, finished in 1952. A huge dragon watches over the place. Inside, the sitting Buddha, in front of the Tree of Awakening, basks in the glow of five neon tubes. It is four in the afternoon and the town's streets liven up as school is over. Car sharing in Western countries is timidly developing, but here, motorcycles are used as public transportation. For the less lucky ones who rely on their two feet, returning home isn't all that sad. There's a candy store on the way. The sun is rising over Hek Zuan Huang Lake in the center of Dala. It owes its name to a Vietnamese poetess from the 17th century, famous for her virulent attacks against social conventions. Dalla's reputation as the jewel of the high plateau has by no means been misappropriated. The rising mist uncovers an absolutely beautiful landscape and unveils a slightly nostalgic vision of Vietnam. Dalla entertains its colonial past, its outdated atmosphere. The French presence of the Indochina era can still be felt. Dalla hosts sumptuous homes, including the summer villa of the Emperor Bao Dai. During the Vietnam War, the city was the object of a tacit agreement that saved it from attacks and bombings. The South Vietnamese officers trained at the academy, while the elite of the Saigon regime rested in their villas as well as the Viet Cong dignitaries in their nearby residences. The city surrendered to the North Vietnamese troops on April 3, 1975. Heading towards the Lang Bian Mountains, you enter a world of forests home to numerous ethnic minorities such as the Lat, they live in this region and try to preserve ancestral traditions in a lively way. Often the allies of the Americans, the Vietnam government during the war made them pay a high price for their emancipation dream. The houses of the Lat are built on stilts and the walls made of planks. Krajam Hai learned French with missionaries in the 1950s and remembers a time where the Lats were free. The coloured poles are the memory of the past. They mean that before being Christians, we were animist. We had many gods, tigers, elephants and many other animals. To honour them, we killed a buffalo with the coloured pole. These mountain people live very frugally from the rice fields. 
they don't appreciate the Vietnamese and claim their ancestral lands and the right to practice their former religion. Reacting to these demands, the government conducted a mandatory integration policy by setting up born and bred Vietnamese in these areas. The Lats, as many other minorities of the highlands, are condemned to a life of misery. Silk embroidery is a very popular Vietnamese art. Special artisan centers exhibit the most beautiful works that sell for high prices. The capital of Can Hoa province, Na Chang, is flanked by a beautiful coastline, one of the most famous in Vietnam. An impressive fishing port hosts multicolored boats that anchor here at low tide. On the docks, fish is drying in the sun. The fishermen go out to sea mainly at night. During the day, they rest and take care of their equipment. Many fishermen still use the thung, a traditional small round boat made with woven bamboo. The wealthier ones own small trawlers. The islands around Na Chang accommodate fish farms where many fishermen of the area work as well as live. These natural aquariums are full of the large diversity of species found in these waters. The thung is an essential means of transportation to go from one farm to the next. Several islands are genuine havens of peace. In Ninh Van Bay, you can stay in a sumptuous villa resort with wooden roofs and enjoy the beauty of the seashore, where days peacefully go by to the rhythm of the fishing boat's movements. Facing Na Chang, Hon Mai is an island where many fishermen live and work. During a break or waiting for the tide, the fishermen play their favorite game, dominoes. Here you have the feeling of a constantly moving world where there is always something to do. <laughs> On the dock, a man sees to it that the thang boats are perfectly waterproof. They are dried in the sun, then the woven bamboo is covered with a blend of palm tree oil and sugar. This syrup is especially effective. It prevents water from seeping in and keeps the boat dry for navigation. Hon Mai is a lively and authentic island where you share the life of these seafaring people of the Vietnamese coast. Aside from the lagoon, the astonishing religious buildings of the Cham dynasty. The Po Naga complex was built between the 7th and 12th century on a site used for Hindu worship as early as the 2nd century. Today, the Chinese and Vietnamese Buddhists come here to pray and make offerings. The towers shelter the sanctuary of Yang Ino Po Naga, the goddess of the Dua clan that reigned over the south of the Cham kingdom. On the other side of the city, the Lon Son Pagoda is worth a detour. 
Built at the end of the 19th century, it protects a laying down Buddha. At the top of the hill, a huge white Buddha, 14 meters high and sitting on a lotus flower, overlooks the city offering a magnificent view of the bay. These landscapes call for relaxation. In Na Chong, you can enjoy numerous traditional spa treatments or learn meditation. It's a good way to understand these Asian cultures where the body and spirit must function together and harmoniously. Certain centers offer musical care sessions with traditional instruments. In traditional Vietnamese medicine, many illnesses are attributed to the pernicious winds. Using suction cups is a way to fight these nasty breezes. It's a treatment that we also use in families. Fire cupping allows to eliminate stress and toxins without leaving marks on the body. It comes from traditional medicine. A stay in Na Chang would not be complete without a short visit to Muay Market or the Fish Market. You will be in the middle of one of the most extraordinary fish selling spots in the world. The number of species is definitely impressive. All creatures that live in water and can be eaten are available here. Confrontations can be surprising and a Westerner may have had a hard time imagining that some of these beasts could end up in his plate. Da Nang spreads on the western shore of the Han River. The city is flanked on one side by the ocean and on the other by five high marble mountains. Today, most of the marble used in Vietnam is imported from China to prevent a massive extraction that would harm tourism and destroy the mountains. Each one represents an element of oriental cosmology, water, wood, fire, metal, earth. The cliff of Tui Son Mountain hides many natural grottos where Hindu, then Buddhist sanctuaries were built over the centuries. A large grotto in the shape of a chimney shelves as a sanctuary. At the end of a passage, two mandarins guard the entrance. A few more meters and the view is striking. You end up in the vast Huen Con Grotto with several Buddhist and Confucian altars. During the war, this grotto was first used to hide Viet Minh soldiers, then as a hospital. <laughs> On the southern side of Tui Son, the small village of Non Nuoc, it is here that artisans create beautiful marble sculptures, an impressive work that enjoys great success among the Asian clientele. Near the Marble Mountains, a gigantic beach, China Beach, owes its name to an American TV series. During the war, American soldiers were dropped here for a few hours or days of rest. For some, the China Beach picnic was their last meal before returning to battle in a helicopter. A genuine live museum, Hoi An, is a harbour. A stroll here is mandatory to enjoy its tremendous charm and enchanting setting. 
Known under the name FIFO, when the first Western traders came here, it was one of the major international seaports of Southeast Asia from the 17th to 19th century. Yet, by the end of the 19th century, the development of other Vietnamese ports marked the fall of Hoi An. Since this decrease in its economical advantage, the city has remained unchanged and was saved from the poorly managed urban expansions that occurred in many other Vietnamese cities or elsewhere in Asia. Hoi An oozes a perfume of history and culture and feeds the illusion of suspended time. The ancient city spreads on the banks of the Tu Bon River. This is where the activity is the most intense with its floating market. Walking in this labyrinth, taking in the scents, admiring the faces, listening to this never-ending bustle, observing ordinary life, you will touch upon one of the facets of today's Vietnam, where an important part of the population leads a traditional life that is not always easy. Every year, the rainy season in October and November brings its share of floods. The most important one in 1964 totally swept over the seaside homes. On the small island of Kam Kim, this couple lost everything in the last floods. Here, this kind of annoyance seems to belong to the order of things. Kam Kim is famous for its woodwork. Most of the ornamentations of the buildings and sculptures in Hoi An are made here. The Tan Kai house, built two centuries ago for a rich Vietnamese merchant, illustrates the amazing talent of the region's artisans. Its layout reveals the Japanese and Chinese influences on local architecture. The ceiling is supported by three beams in different sizes. Chinese poems written in inlaid mother of pearl hang from several columns. The mythological and legendary bestiary is absolutely beautiful. Outside, the walls still bear the marks of the last flood. But a few weeks later, the streets are clean again and nothing reminds us of the phenomenon's violence. Since 1999, UNESCO has listed Hoi An as a World Heritage Site. The ancient city greatly profits from regulations that try to preserve its heritage by opening the doors of historical and cultural monuments to visitors and regulating the traffic of motorized vehicles. In these conditions, Hoi An could preserve this peaceful atmosphere that contributes to its charm and reputation. Leaving the city, the countryside offers these rice-filled landscapes where peasants are busy repairing the plots after the floods. The hyacinth fields were also destroyed. In the meantime, fishing goes on. Five kilometers from Hoi An, Khao Dai is lined with palm trees and a 30 kilometer long beach that reaches Da Nang. Walking here is a very pleasant experience. A few fishermen families don't hesitate to go out to sea with their thung and overcome the sandbar. Leaving Hoi An, we have to take the high sea and cloud pass, then descend on the other side towards Lang Ko and its lagoon. 
lined with palm trees, Lanco is a pleasant fine sand beach like an island. On one side, it faces a blue turquoise lagoon and on the other, the China Sea. These splendid landscapes of Lanco are visible north of the Haivan Pass. Here too, time seems to have stopped. On the seaside, fishermen still use ancestral methods and boats. On earth, men and buffaloes work hard in the rice fields. Everything here offers images of a Vietnam we think is eternal. In the rice fields, the inhabitants still employ a traditional fishing method that consists in hitting bamboos to make the fish flee and head towards the nets. Near Vinh Hien, strange constructions appear. These family tombs and temples are spacious, opulent and colourful. The families rival in ingenuity to offer the most beautiful resting places to their ancestors. The Vietnamese call it the city of the tombs. This island has witnessed the exodus of many boat people. Today, the Vietnamese living abroad finance these amazing constructions. In the Ue region, the former imperial capital, the cult of the dead takes on an even more spectacular dimension. The majestic tomb of Tu Duc, built between 1864 and 1867, proudly sits among frangipan trees and pine trees. Tu Duc was buried in this harmonious monument that he had designed himself. The expense was tremendous and the workers forcefully recruited. Tu Duc, whose reign was the longest of the Nguyen dynasty, lived in excessive luxury. Despite 104 wives and countless concubines, he left no descendants probably because he became sterile after having had syphilis. Another impressive tomb of this valley of the Vietnamese kings is that of the Emperor Cai Din, who reigned from 1916 to 1925. The construction of the imperial tomb lasted longer than his reign, as it was finished in 1931 after 11 years of work. This tomb stands out from the other imperial sepulchres of Hue as it combines Vietnamese and European elements. This cultural blend can even be seen on the Eurasian faces of the stone mandarins that represent the honor guards. Started during the colonial period, this tomb illustrates the decline of Vietnamese culture. Ue is the ancient imperial capital and thus a major cultural and religious center. Every year, the beautiful tombs of the Nguyen dynasty attract thousands of visitors. Without tourism, the cultural sites of Ue would probably have been forgotten, as they are deemed politically incorrect by the communist government. The construction of the citadel, surrounded by moats spreading over a 10-kilometer perimeter, was started in 1804 on a site chosen by Emperor Jia Long's geomancy experts. The imperial city located in the citadel is in itself protected by a canal and brick walls six meters high. Inside the citadel, many buildings were destroyed during the Tet Offensive in 1968. These monuments are a testimony to the luxury surrounding the Nguyen dynasty that reigned and consolidated the unity of the country during a century and a half up to French colonization.
In Hanoi, Ho Chi Minh, the hero of independence, had nothing to complain about compared to the emperors of the past. The resting place of Uncle Ho established a personality cult. His mausoleum is the most visited monument of Vietnam. It is closed to the public three months a year as the mummified corpse of Ho Chi Minh is sent to Russia for special care. The district of the presidential palace comprises ancient colonial houses used today for embassies and army headquarters. The palace in itself was a 1906 colonial home that was beautifully restored and used to be the palace of the general governor of Indochina. In Hanoi, the One Pillar Pagoda is a venerated place. All in wood, it rests on a stone pillar. Destroyed by the French in 1954 before they left the city, it was rebuilt by the new government. Endowed with a timeless graciousness, the Vietnamese capital has better endured the years than most of its Asian contemporaries. After Vietnam was divided in 1954, Hanoi fell into a deep sleep from which it woke up only 40 years later thanks to economic reforms. A beautiful example of French colonial architecture, Hanoi escaped the damaging curse of American bombs and Soviet-style urbanization. This dynamic old city has bustled with trade activities for eight centuries. It's the ideal place to sound out this re-emerging capital. Professions and shop owners are regrouped by activity, including blacksmiths, roofers, tinsmiths, mirror manufacturers. An entire street is dedicated to bamboo. Elsewhere, you can find all the painted lanterns that eliminate the calendar's holidays. Here you can see the fantastic puppet shows on the water. At first, it was a hobby for the peasants working in the northern rice fields. They are said to have used the surface of the water as a natural stage or to have adapted the traditional puppet show after floods inundated the Red River Delta. In any case, this thousand-year-old art hasn't lost any of its magical effect. In the heart of Hanoi, Hoan Kiem Lake is such a beautiful place. The surroundings are full of activity as early as six in the morning. People from the neighborhood come here to practice the traditional Tai Chi, jog or play badminton. Blending Asian serenity and Parisian elegance, Hanoi enters paradoxes in a communist country where the chic district's boutiques offer the latest in terms of international fashion. Here again, the nostalgia for the colonial era prevails with beautiful buildings and their French-style decoration. Just pull the drapes and you'll think you're in Paris. Giving on to the lake, the opera prolongs the stroll in a Parisian atmosphere. Luckily, Hanoi also has marvelous monuments in the traditional architectural style. Two kilometers from Huan Kiem Lake, the Temple of Literature is a true haven of peace. Built in 1070 by the Emperor Li Tan Tong, it was dedicated to Confucius to honor the educated and the great authors. In 1076, the first university of Vietnam was inaugurated here, destined to educate the sons of mandarins. <laughs> Leaving Hanoi, we head for the northwest of the country and its most astonishing landscapes. These mountain regions are also home to ethnic minorities whose lifestyle, for some, has remained unchanged for generations, despite exterior influences. 
Since their migration from China during the 19th century, the Hmong have become one of the most important ethnic communities of Vietnam. They live at high altitudes where they raise animals, cultivate rice fields and medicinal plants, including opium. They are divided in several subgroups, the black, white, red, green and flower mongs, noticeable by the discrete variations of their traditional costumes. But their ancestral culture is fragile and their lifestyle is rapidly evolving. The government tries to encourage tribes to become more sedentary by using schools as an incentive. Language and education also become means of integration without taking into account the specificity of these populations. <laughs> However, their sense of identity remains strong, even among the young who convey their attachment to their culture and traditions in the details of their clothes. These high leggings that one ties around the calf are a major element in the attire. If you are a Hmong, you must wear them because we don't wear pants. When we go into the mountains, it's a good way to protect yourself from snakes and mosquitoes. Their pretty and low-priced traditional clothes are dyed with natural products and are not set. As a result, the colours of most fabrics are likely to rub off on everything they touch in a strange shade of greenish-blue. To believe it, all you have to do is look at the arms and hands of the Hmong. For these minorities, life has always been difficult. Their most successful stable is opium, a product that never was fully tolerated by the Vietnamese authorities. Vietnamization has only worsened the situation. Tourism based on the respect of these cultures could be the answer to the survival and development of these regions. Almost daily, the mountain people of the area put on their shimmering clothes and head for the supper market. The charm of Sapa lies in its encounter between the Hmong and Dao minorities, the most widely represented ethnic groups in this area. Very poor, these mountain people have nevertheless fairly quickly embraced free enterprise. Most of them never went to school, yet you would be surprised to hear the youngest speak English and French. It is hard to come to Vietnam without visiting the legendary bays of the Gulf of Tonkin. Bathed by the Red River and the ocean, the fertile northern area is the cradle of Vietnamese civilization. The stormy historical relationship between Vietnam and China was born here. The island of Cat Bar is the first stopover to these peaceful bays whose beaches are unfortunately the object of negotiations to build hotels. However, in the centre of the island, the authorities had the good idea to create a natural reserve that shelters several endemic species. Birds, mammals, medicinal plants, rare wood and thousands of butterflies can peacefully prosper here.
our adventure naturally leads us to one of the most beautiful landscapes in the world. Imagine 3,000 islands rising from the emerald green waters of the Gulf of Tonkin. Heilong Bay is Vietnam's marvel. In 1668, a Chinese visitor used these words. The appearance of these sugar loaves puzzles our imagination. At times when you contemplate them, they offer you a resemblance with wild animals or sitting fierce warriors. Heilong means where the dragon goes down into the sea. Local legend says that the mountain sheltered a huge dragon. One day, as he was running towards the sea, he created valleys and crevices with his waggling tail. When he dove into the water, the holes filled with water, only leaving a few emerged pieces of land. The dragon that created Tonkin Bay may belong to a legend, yet in these waters, sailors claim to have seen a mysterious creature known here as the Tarasque. The most paranoid military maintain that it's a submarine spying for the imperialist. Eccentric travelers believe the dragon is the Vietnamese version of the Loch Ness Monster. In the meantime, the monster continues to haunt the bay and to successfully avoid the ocean police and customs officers. The bay has been on UNESCO's World Heritage List since 1993, yet a second inscription was recently requested by the Vietnamese authorities to determine its ecological importance. Under pressure from the international scientific world, the purpose is to protect the lower part of the cliffs from pollution that threatens them. The numerous hotel boats that anchor here at night are not without danger. This dragon is most probably the real spirit of Vietnam, mysterious, elusive, playing with the maze of a difficult history to appear where it's not expected. Always ready to spit fire, yet he never ceases to seduce us.